Episode 4 with improv artist and producer Adam Hembry. Hi, and welcome to Barn Raisers. Thanks for tuning in, thanks for telling your friends, and thanks for all the support online. We really appreciate all the comments, questions, likes and reviews. It's really helpful and it allows us to keep putting out the show each week, so please keep it coming. If this is your first barn raising, then welcome aboard. We're so glad you made it. What goes on here? Well, each week we come together to talk about teams and all things team related. Barn Raisers is the number one place to hear from some of the brightest and the best collaborators, leaders and problem solvers on the planet. We welcome special guests from all walks of life to learn about what being an ultimate team player really means and to get a first-hand account of what makes some teams great and others not so great. So sit back, buckle up and get ready. The show starts now. Adam Hembry has been collaborating with others on stage in some form or fashion since the age of 13, when he tackled the venerable role of orphan in a smash hit high school production of Oliver. Fast forward just a little bit, and Adam's now been performing and studying Shakespeare since 2008. In 2011, Adam trained and performed as an ensemble member with the renowned National Comedy Theatre in Phoenix, Arizona. But it was when he moved to Melbourne in 2014 that things began to take an unexpected turn. For it was at this time he took a free drop-in class at the Improv Conspiracy, and he's been hooked on improv and the unexpected ever since. While he's on the clock, Adam pursues a PhD in English and Theatre Studies at the University of Melbourne. When he's off the clock, he performs in Shakespeare's language with soothe players, the totally improvised Shakespeare troupe that he co-founded with creative partner Ryan Patterson in 2015. I came across Sooth Players and Adam when I attended another of the troupe's productions at the 2017 Melbourne International Comedy Festival. The show was called Totally Improvised Potter. It was unbelievably entertaining to watch as the team put together an entire Harry Potter movie on the fly using nothing more than a title for the evening that was submitted by an audience member and plucked out of the Goblet of Fire. But what really struck me was the way the team worked together on stage. It was a masterclass that showed some of the most important skills that any team member could wish to develop. Listening, acceptance, acknowledgement, feedback, asking questions and honouring someone's contribution were all on show. I was torn between laughing along with the audience and getting my phone out to take notes. After the show, I had to ask the cast members about coming on the podcast. And that's when they pointed me in the direction of Adam. And I'm so grateful they did. And I'm sure you will be too. So I sat down with Adam on campus at the beautiful Melbourne University. And as you might pick up, I was getting over a little bit of a cold at the time. So whilst Adam sounds great, I might not sound so crash hot in places. So apologies in advance, I was a little bit under the weather. Now in this show, Adam's going to tell you a story of collaboration from a perspective we don't often get to hear, and he explains it so very well. So get comfortable, have a pen and paper at the ready, and enjoy listening to Adam Hembry. second as a company uh and the first that we produce completely improvised potter at it's a so it's our second show for improvised shakespeare that was the one i saw yeah it was, yeah <laughs> it was fantastic i'm glad you liked it It was great how, how many people are involved in the show i know there was a there was a handful in ours you've got a handful then going into shakespeare yeah that's right um both of them have kind of larger ensembles and we rotate through them to have seven playing on each night 
So Shakespeare, we have about 16 uh, regular members. And then in Potter, we have a bit more uh, around 20, 22. Oh, wow. Um, and so, yeah, they kind of take turns. It's always a different cast every night and a different show as a result. And how much planning goes into who's going to do what and when? And do you, or is it just you're on go? Uh, yeah. I mean, look, if you talk to our director, a lot of planning goes into actually organizing the schedules and casting the shows. But as far as on the night, you have no planning. Uh, yeah. You get the title from the audience and then scenes begin. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's something to behold for people that are listening. Uh, unless you've seen it, it really is, um, it is, it is pure improv. It is literally a name comes out of a hat or a, a title comes out of a hat. And away the away the cast goes for the best part of an hour, I think. It was. Yeah, that's right. It's the uh, the goblet of fire for our Harry Potter show instead of a hat. Uh, yep. Although we do have the sorting hat as well. Yeah, <laughs> it gives a little bit of a spiel. Yeah, um, we've performed some weird titles in the past and some very kind of orthodox sounding ones. Um, we have a good time with both. Yeah, and tell me how was the how was the festival for you guys? Was it, it was a success? It was. We we had a, a great festival. Um, between the two shows, we had almost three and a half thousand people um, to the around 45 total shows that we put on in about three and a half weeks. Yep. So we're very pleased with that. Um, Potter in particular sold like wildfire. Uh, yeah. It was a really, really great uh, debut season for us. And so we're really excited to, to keep playing it. Right. Yeah. Right. And we'll get into that a bit later on, sort of where people can go and what's coming up and what you've got planned. But um, did you play in the Potter series as well? Did you have? Do you put yourself in the rotation, so to speak? <laughs> I've not played with them yet. No, I'm a I'm a producer for both Shakespeare and Potter, and I play in the Shakespeare show. Right. Um, and my fellow producer Ryan uh, plays in both. He's a he's a wizard. Um, so no, I haven't played <laughs> with Potter yet. Although they're an excellent group of humans, and I'm sure I would love it. Well, what is it? Do you think, Adam, that a bad improv that becomes so appealing to an audience? What is it that drags people in and, and they have to come and watch? I think the most appealing thing about it is that the audience has a stake in the show right mm -hmm. away. Uh, and so they feel a bit more invested because they've actually contributed something. Uh, and great improv troops, I think, make an effort to make their audience feel included, whether it's from the way they address them at the front or the way they in help people come into the show. The other thing I think that kind of separates improv from other great comedy is you walk into a stand-up show, for example, and you kind of sit back and think, all right, impress me. Um, mm -hmm. You've come up with these jokes for, for months or years, and you've really been crafting this uh, to deliver it just so, and you expect that. Whereas with improv, the promise is different. The yeah. promise is, no, they, they really haven't planned this. They're going to make it up on the spot. And I think, I know that when I'm in an improv audience, I feel more generous to the players than I do when I'm watching right. other comedy. Right. Yeah. So there's a sense, I mean, this is a, a team-based show. There's a sense that the audience then is also then able to be part of that team, if you like, to make it a great night or make it a great production. Yeah, their their energy is a huge part of whether we are having a good show. And I think great great troops can play to any crowd and have a great show. And likewise, you can have a less than stellar show, even with a great crowd. And, yeah. you know, they both can happen, but... It's such a difference to have a really energetic crowd who's on board and excited and they're making noise. Uh, it it really does amp you up and I think it contributes a lot to your work on yeah. stage. Well, let's talk a bit about then your background in particular. I'm keen to know, obviously, telling by your accent, you're not from, <laughs> you're not from England and part of uh, Shakespeare <laughs> no, times no. and you're not part of Australia. So a little bit about your background, if you would, and, and a little bit about how you got here and uh, the journey that you took in terms of getting all the way through to creating Sooth play Players with your with your partner, Ryan. Um, so I will have been in Australia for three years this June. I um, migrated this way from the United States, where I'm from originally. Um, I was born in Mississippi. It's where I lived um, till I went to uni. And then I bounced around the States, lived in Philadelphia for a bit uh, just before I moved here. And I'm in Australia because my partner is actually from Melbourne. So she and I met when we were both working on a summer camp in upstate New York. Uh, and when I finished doing my master's there, I, uh, we both decided it was easier for me to move here than her to move there. And I, I don't regret that choice a bit. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it in Melbourne. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my PhD here now, uh, which is really a great stroke of luck. Um, and yeah, I, I understand why Melbourne's considered the most livable city on okay. earth by so many publications <laughs> terrific yeah. <laughs> yeah well we like to think so so right right <laughs> yeah just ask anyone and they'll probably tell you around the university they'll, they'll be more than happy to, to let you know I, i'm really interested in in dialing into how you created sooth players and how that story came up i mean part of 
creating any team and in the role that you've got in this team being one of the leaders how did you come about creating that team and selling the vision and the passion the idea what was what was the story behind that um it started when ryan patterson and i were attending a workshop together um who it was delivered by uh, a very talented uh woman named jenny lovell who improvises here around melbourne and she it was the workshop was an intensive one on improvising in shakespearean style um in uh kind of short form improvisation, it's very popular to play a game called Shakespeare where you, you know, you adopt some of these tropes and you play with some of these kind of conventions in the language, especially, and it's really fun and funny. Um, and so after that workshop, Ryan and I were just really inspired and we had a really great time. So um, we spoke to each other and said, hey, we should probably keep doing this for fun. Uh, yeah. And we got in touch with some other people we knew who were great improvisers and great actors and, more importantly, uh, good people. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we found ourselves a director who was passionate about the material and who was keen to do it. And we just started meeting once a week and, um, you know, practicing. And our first show was the Melbourne Fringe Festival in 2015. Uh, and it was such a good time and a success that we... <coughs> We made it really a regular thing, started the website, uh, and we've been playing ever since. Wow. That's great. And you have, it's not like you're, it's not, this isn't like you just went to that one workshop and said, I'm going to do improv. You've been doing that previously, hadn't you? It's something yes. you've been doing in the States. Yeah, on and off for a long time. I, I took my first improv class when I was 15 at a summer camp. Um, summer camp keeps coming up. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was like a summer camp for nerds, though. It was the best kind yeah. uh, called Governor <laughs> School. And uh, I loved that class so much. I had never done anything like that. I had seen a few episodes of Whose Line Is It Anyway mm. and loved it, but I had no personal experience. Um, so then fast forward to uni and I had a similar experience where I had some a little bit of experience with an improv troupe. And my first extended experience was in Phoenix, Arizona, where I lived for a couple of years after undergrad uh, with a theater called the National Comedy Theater, um, which was incredible fun. And I got to actually play in front of live audiences doing that for the first time. Uh, and it, it gave me the itch, I guess. So as soon as I moved to Melbourne, the first thing I did was Google what troops are where around can I here. Go? Where can I take classes? And I took classes at a place called the Improv Conspiracy. Um, and you have a couple of great options around Melbourne, and they were the one that I chose. And so I finished their program, and I played on a, um, a Herald team. Herald is a kind of long-form uh, format of improvisation. Right. Uh, and so I played with them for a while, and I've been teaching classes with them uh, ever since as well, which is one of my favorite things to do, actually, teaching introductory improv teaching. classes. Yeah, oh, it's, okay. it's so much fun. I will get into that in a little bit. I'm interested to see see how that works. Sure thing. One of the things is um, the question that I had, and, and just watching the show and the people who were playing on the night that I went and obviously talking to you, is when does the idea of stepping on stage without a script, you say, I wanna, I'm going to perform, I like this, it's going to be fun, but when did the idea of stepping on stage without a script and the pressure to perform go from being this is terrifying to being fun. Is it like the first time you do it and you go, hey, this is all right? Um, kind of like any extreme sport, the terror is actually part of the fun. Right. So if you lose your terror, you maybe should take a break. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe you're a bit complacent right. um, or you need to try to ex extend, expand what you're doing. Uh, I always was drawn to that aspect of it precisely because when you throw yourself out past your own expectations, you end up coming up with things you couldn't predict. And that's the that's the self-enduring fun part of it. Like you surprise yourself, which is always fun. And then you also get to meet incredible people. Um, and they come from all different walks of life, from the corporate world, from the creative side of things, uh, people who just want to get better at public speaking. Uh, and then they all end up contributing in really fun ways, which is different than doing stage plays, which I also love and mm. have done. Um, it, it has a different energy about it, a real warmth. And I, um, when I discovered that, when I first started playing regularly with a troupe, I, I got addicted to that. Is there a typical personality type for improv artists? We hear we hear about the improv artists like a Tina Fey or someone like that who come from improv and they've got bigger than larger than life personalities. Is there a, is there a typical um, personality type for an improv artist? Do you think? I think there's a range. Um, I would dispel the myth that performers tend to be extroverts. I don't. I don't think that aligns with my own experience. I think a lot of performers are very comfortable getting in front of people and putting on a show. Um, but for a lot of introverts, that's exactly what you do every day. Yeah. <laughs> when, you're, when you're in front True. of people, you put on a bit of an act. Um, so I, I think it's more complicated than that. I do think that there's different kinds. I love 
um, Billy Merritt, who's a, an improv coach in America, has this schema that there are pirates and robots and ninjas okay. uh, on stage. And yeah. so some people are full of energy and they, and they love to break things and they, they really mess everything up in the best way. Those are pirates. Yep. Robots are very critical thinking, detail oriented. They see the patterns in things. And ninjas are um, incredible because they move the show. They make those small moves, the little bits of seasoning that make things perfect. Yep. Uh, and you almost don't notice them. That's why they're ninjas. Right. Um, so I think you you discover kind of loose buckets that you sit in as a player. But as a person, it's as, it's really as broad as any sample size. I that's think. whatever you get. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose that's the same thing on a team if you're in a business team or whatever it is. And I'm guessing that you'd almost you'd almost have to have all three of those types in this in this case. Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean, look, anybody who does improv ends up seeing things through the lens of improv. Um it's yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like that. So I 100% agree with that. I think you can map that logic onto so many things. And then you can start to see how it breaks in fun ways. Like some people aren't quite one or the other, and that's fun. So what are the what are the, well, if it's not the personality type, then what what would you say are some of the skills that can make a great team player for improv? I think there's a handful of great ones. Um, the things that I've learned to appreciate developing over the last few years are things like situational awareness uh, and especially active listening. I think the the sort of drills that we do to prepare ourselves to improvise all are about taking in a lot of sensory data at once and sifting through it, mm. kind of retaining what's useful and then keeping it. And so knowing that you can recognize the moment to bring that back, to use it again. Um, you also have to be able to know when something is affecting you. And that's always been one of my kind of bigger challenges or bugbears, like know what you're feeling in mm -hmm. that moment and then express it if you can, um, or use it to some effect on stage. Uh, and then, the most important one, I think, is play, uh, which is really the ability to act even though you're afraid. Uh, yeah. You you lose you have that fear, I should say, of um, that fear of looking foolish, the fear of um, people thinking less of you, uh, the fear that people are critiquing your every move, and you have that fear, and then you do something anyway. And I think mm. that's what you're doing when you're playing. Um, and then when you do that enough, you start to forget that you're afraid. And that is um, that is actually a skill, I think. And you get to get better Absolutely. at it, which I love. Well, that's also, I think, courage. I mean, yeah. there's courage in that acting when you're afraid and still going through with it. That's a courage thing as well. Which is something I tell to level one improv students all the time, is that nobody walks up on that stage without being afraid. Yep. Um, so you're, you're in good company. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I've never spoken to her, but I would guarantee you Tina Fey still gets afraid in some respects yeah. about doing what she the does. The self-doubt would come up or yeah, the question of, yeah, yeah. is this going to be good enough? Absolutely. Yeah. And so one of the things you have to kind of, um, one of those first walls to break through when you're learning improv is to, is to tell yourself that you're enough. Mm. You have to, you have to just accept on dumb faith that yeah. in fact you are enough. What you offer is going to be okay. And you can acknowledge that you're going to hate it and doubt it and second guess it. But the person across from you is going to accept it and move forward with it. And that's going to make you feel really good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I think that word that you used just then and before, that, that acceptance of what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at it in teams, in businesses and, and at work, in work situations. There's not an acceptance of what I'm feeling. There's almost like I can't show anyone what I accept. There's no, mm -hmm. I can't accept what I'm feeling. It's got to be portrayed as something else to someone else rather than saying, well, I'm just going to go with it. And see what happens. Yeah, we slip into our codes, right? And so certain codes are acceptable. Uh, so in a cutthroat business environment that we can imagine, um, one code is strength. Uh, so you communicate that strength by keeping your face impassive, by having a rigid posture, by speaking forcefully. And that tells people you know what you're doing, that you have power, and that they should look up to you. Mm. Um, and if you don't adhere to that code, even if all those things are true about you, um, then you're seen as somehow... Um, subpar or failing right. uh, and that that leaves an opening for someone to come at you right and yep. the, in improv the opening is what we want we want people to show that soft underbelly to stab because that's what audiences love is that's to, right is to see people be affected that's right and i think then what that then breeds is if you can do that then there's a trust element that comes into it as well you've got to have trust amongst the people that you're working with and mm -hmm. i suppose the audience as well mm -hmm. that it's really you're not going to get harmed because of it Exactly. Um, you're, that trust is founded on a mutual understanding that when I behave this way, you will accept it and you'll know that it's me. Uh, and that removes a lot of stress because you have enough stress of already course. with getting the thing done, whatever it is that you're trying to do together, right? Yeah. So if you can trust that 
um, the people around you will watch you make mistakes and laugh through them with you, then that's so much better than expecting them to eviscerate you publicly. <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Well, I was thinking a little bit about um, some of what I saw at your show, and I thought there's maybe an idea that we could use, and it's not, I'll, I'll be honest, it's not my idea, mm -hmm. but I thought, I don't know if I could do improv. Maybe by the end of this episode, you could <laughs> teach me some things and sure. maybe I'd get a better idea. <laughs> sure. But I was thinking about maybe you could have someone like a warm-up person that came in, and, and there's someone on Twitter or there's a, a Twitter account called Shakespeare Song, and I thought with you being improv and Shakespeare, Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could we could try a few things out and we could see how it goes. But one of the things um, that this person does is they talk about, they take popular songs mm -hmm. and they turn them into Shakespeare sonnets, if you like. <laughs> uh, so what I thought might be a bit of fun, just as we're in the middle of the podcast to break it up, is maybe play a game where I'm going to give you three sets of lyrics. I'm going to see if you can guess what the songs are. Does that sound you up for that? Yep, I'm I'm down. We'll we'll All go right. down in flames lovingly. <laughs> right. Well, I'll accept whatever it is that you give me. I'm good, we'll good. We'll You're we'll learning. It's it. great. There we go. <laughs> all right. So the first one is: We all reside in a vessel that submerges under the ocean, sharing its color with the sun. Uh, this has got to be the Beatles' "Yellow Submarine." Correct. He oh. knows his stuff. There we go. All right. The next one. This one is: Greetings, Jude. Do not make thy <laughs> present situation worse. Take a melancholy tune and improve its quality. We're sticking with the Beatles, I see. A bit of Hey Jude. Two of the Beatles so far. That's right. All right, we'll change things up. The third one. His palms doth pos <laughs> Sorry. His palms doth perspire. His knees feeble. <laughs> Arms doth weigh in excess. Vomit hath appeared on his garments already. Mother's Italian cuisine. And though he be ready, bombs to drop upon that surface, <laughs> calm and ready. Oh, oh, that's got to be Eminem, right? That's correct. Use yourself. All okay. right. <laughs> yeah, I love that Twitter handle, actually. Um, I've not read those versions of that song, but it's such a it's such a fun concept. It is. It's really cool. I got another idea if you're up for it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I thought I was going to get you, maybe if you're up for it, to improvise some lyrics for us, like you just did so well, <laughs> okay. but with three other songs. So we'll reverse it. This time I'll give you some normal lyrics. Okay. And then you take as long as you need. <laughs> I'm guessing it won't take very long, but take as long as you need to write out whatever lyrics you can come up with in a, in a Shakespeare theme. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to avoid writing them if I can. So if I said to you the song is Billy Joel's Piano Man, and the, the verse we want to go with is, it's nine o'clock on a Saturday, the regular crowd shuffles in. There's an old man sitting next to me, making love to his tonic and gin. <laughs> on Saturday, the bells strike nine. The maddening crowd sits. An elderly gent in the chair next to mine. Gin and bitters his imbibing bent very good all right very good <laughs> all right so let's go let's go up a notch we're going to take it up a notch the next one is get low by flow rider <laughs> all right now this is nothing about my musical taste by the way these are just i <laughs> have zero judgment zero judgment <laughs> about right. it i shouldn't apologize that's right <laughs> in improv mode okay so the words for those that are playing along at home is let me talk talk let me talk talk let it rain let me talk, talk. Come on. Shorty had them apple bottom jeans, jeans, boots with the fur, with the. All right. Um, do permit me to speak. I say again, permit me to speak. Let the clouds break loose and shed their holy tears. I beg you, permit me to speak. Come now, wastrel. She had pantaloons that did swell as the bosom of a very Eden's apple. My, my, the elegant stretch of her feet, not the hooves of a devil, nay, but furred all the same. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. <laughs> all right. And we've got one more. Let's see how we go with this one. This one's Macklemore and Thrift Shop. Something about rapping. I just think about Shakespeare trying to rap in his day. You're um you're not the first to make that connection. Mark Rylance, who's a famous Shakespeare actor, thinks that um hip freestyle hip hop is one of the closest things to the sort of innovations Shakespeare and his fellows were making right. at the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And now we're now we're merging the two. This <laughs> Here is we really go. cool. All right, so Macklemore's thrift shop. We're gonna go with the with the 
with the most commonly known section, which is I'm going to pop some tags. I only got $20 in my pocket. I, I, I'm hunting, looking for a come up. This is fucking awesome. All right. Um, <clears throat> the price, dear heart, is writ upon my sleeves. But the ducats in my purse, only twenty in number. I search, I pine, I weep, advancement to gain. This life, O oh heavens, is not but pure joy. <laughs> oh, that's sensational. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> that's good fun. Yeah, yeah. I like uh, it. Yeah, this is we um we like to do um some drills sometimes. I say drills, that makes it sound terrible. Games really yeah. in our rehearsals where we um where we translate common uh contemporary English into sort of Shakespearean idioms. It's mm -hmm. really um and you you'd be surprised how quickly you can shift from one to the two if you just make a couple of changes uh, yeah. into to your pronouns uh into the endings of a few words and suddenly it's uh it's 1600 yeah it yeah. sounds like a really fun game it's a, it could be a good one to, for party games and dinner, dinner times for people <laughs> yeah sure i'll charge you by the hour it'd be great <laughs> it sounds great <laughs> <laughs> well it does i mean doing improv if we come back to it now um doing improv and what's involved in it it sounds so simple like there's no planning there's no script you just show up and it's go now Clearly, that's not the case. I'm, I, you make it look so good doing that, but it's clearly not the case. So what's really going on? I mean, before a show and, and behind the scenes, what are people doing and, and what are they thinking? What, are, what goes through their mind? I appreciate that it looks simple. Uh, and, um, you know, simple isn't the same as easy, I guess. So mm. uh, it's straightforward, but it, it does take a lot of behind the scenes work that we call rehearsal, but it's not rehearsal in that traditional sense where you're practicing lines and blocking movements. Um, instead, you're, what you're really doing is developing skills. Um, and if you like to think in terms of like knowledge and skills and mindsets mm. as a kind of hierarchy of, of action. If you know my work, I love that. Okay, great, <laughs> That's great. <what> I'm <laughs> I'll pretend I did my research. <laughs> yeah. um, so then you, you have a knowledge base already that's always changing. And when you do these kind of um, practice exercises, you're developing skills. Um, and then you frame those things with a mindset. So you have mindsets like there are no mistakes, there are only opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have that mindset, then when you're doing a skills practice, let's say on your language and using the and thou the right way and things like that, then you have a mindset that if someone does mess up their language, let's say they say shoulds when they should say should, <laughs> um, then you could point that out to their embarrassment, you could ignore it. Or you could make something of it. You could make that a character choice that they made mm. uh, and show it to the audience as a, as a brilliant idea they had yeah. uh, to be more lowbrow than they ought to be in their position. Mm -hmm. now, now that's a game we can play for the rest of that show, that this person uh, talks like a lower class person or something like that. Right. Um, and that, that gives us so much more to work with than the other two choices, yep. which, which were just less fun. So like you said before, it's all about uh, embracing that opening, whatever someone opens up to you about themselves you embrace that and try and build on that as a strength that you mm -hmm. can use yeah absolutely i can think of an example actually i flubbed a word in the beginning of a show i meant to say the word noble and i i said global <laughs> uh, i have no idea what was in my head <laughs> I, it just it was a slip of the tongue um and in the moment i was like oh crap um, <laughs> and then i went off stage after that soliloquy was done and immediately uh, nikki one of our players walked out on stage and she was in a conversation about something completely different, just dropped that, oh, yes, that's that's what the grobility are doing these days. <laughs> um, and for the rest of the show, anytime anyone said noble or nobility, it was grobal or grobility. No explanation, yeah. just that's the way this world works, and then we move on. Yeah. Um, and it was I felt so relieved, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. That's great. And what goes – one of the questions I had, and I was watching people, because we got there a little bit early on the night that I the, – the particular night that I went. And was just watching. Everyone's out in the audience. Like the people, there was nowhere to sit in the room we were in. I don't think there was any <laughs> backstage. There was none of that. It was sure. just, here's the room. What was going, but everyone was walking around greeting people. It was all cool. But they were five minutes away from, right, ready, set, go. Mm -hmm. So what's what what's the mind of an improv player, say, five minutes before the show when the audience is in there and 
what's that what's that mindset look like i think f my personal experience is that those five minutes are the most nerve-wracking of mm. the night uh because we have some time as a cast generally for at least 10 15 minutes um either in the back of the venue or somewhere outside to warm up a bit do a couple of quick exercises get our get synced together as a group um but then once we're in that room like you say our style in both the shakespeare and potter shows is to welcome our audiences in mm. um so the potter folks uh you know are basically prefects at Hogwarts and telling all the first years to sit in the right place. Um, and so they were playing a character. But also in that moment, um, whether you're doing Potter or Shakespeare, when we are welcoming people in, in language, and um, we are also reckoning with the fact that we're about to start this thing. Mm. And so we have some time to think. And that's when you get the most nervous, is when you're in your own head, uh, and you're not working as a, as a unit with others, you're just thinking. Yeah. Um, and so then all those kind of ghosts come up and you're mm -hmm. like, you feel it in the pit of your stomach. Um, and we learn to deal with that by recognizing that it is nervousness. It's also excitement. Um, and when you're playing with people you have experience with and you trust, then you can, you can let that just be excitement, uh, mm -hmm. and know that it'll pass <laughs> in a couple of minutes yep. when you're in the middle of the thing itself. And then it goes. Yeah. 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 Wow. And then what, let's jump to the end of a show then. One of the questions that I had thinking and preparing for this podcast was, how do you review a performance? I mean, what are you looking at when you review? What happened or how can it get better? And, and where, does, where does the point of review come in in an improv sense? I, my experience doing scripted work, notes are very different, right? You, you get actual notes that say, oh, yeah, you missed this word in this line. Uh, you missed this entrance by your cue. Um, and it's very specific and almost like rewriting. Like you, mm. you're saying, okay, you did this. This exact thing next time is going to be different. Um, and you can't rewrite an improvised show. No. So instead, our notes tend to be at the level of um, – skills and mindsets based on that experience just in right so yep. um our director uh is adept at diagnosing based on what we just saw what sort of skills would be helpful to emphasize at our next rehearsal mm. uh and in our warm-ups before the next show so if people are seeming a bit hesitant maybe we'll do warm-ups that really emphasize energy mm. and diving in and committing yep um maybe if our scenes are going a bit long for our tastes we'll do warm-ups and skill building exercises that encourage clipping and fast pace yep uh and it's just an ongoing integration of those those strategies really that's interesting i mean and it's something I think you can take out. Like a corporate world, it's all about performance. People mm -hmm. do performance reviews and they last for 12 months and we're going to review your performance for 12 months. It's going to go on and on mm -hmm. and on, never ends. Yep. But then if we sat, there, sat back and went, well, let's focus on the skills and mindsets we need to develop, mm -hmm. then that might be more beneficial than just harping on performance, performance, performance. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think one of the reasons for that is that when you talk about performance, one of the words that comes up is competence. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about your core competencies or what, you know, and that, that is almost always quantified. Yes. You, you, you score on a scale um, or a rubric. Yep. And um, while that's useful as a thought process, it's also a bit obstructive to real progress sometimes. I think, as you say, if you have a couple of core mindsets or a couple of core concepts that drive your individual choices, then if people are aware of how they work and what they mean, then they will immediately understand your feedback when you say, okay, um, it seems like you're you're not uh, open to listening. Mm -hmm. Say that's one of your core mindsets that you're saying. It seems like you're you're a bit um, that you're blocking off offers from other people. That you're not quite taking on board what people say, and that's apparent in these kinds of actions. That's a much more actionable bit of feedback right. than to say, "Oh, you know what? In in scene three last night, um, I think you." you mentioned Snickers bars and that's anachronistic. So don't, don't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like that's such a yeah. very specific thing. And that's it's hard, right. it's hard to turn that into action. Well, you almost need that to happen again. So you've almost <laughs> got to perform the opposite of what you want to be in order to have the opportunity to perform the way that you need to be and go, sure. oh, I got it this time. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not really what the aim of the, the feedback is. No. And there's just such an infinite possibility of details you could nitpick. So you really, it helps to zoom out a bit and look at patterns, look at um, mm. behaviors and mindsets so that you can say, um, next time you start a scene, I'd like for you to be really emotional, um, just as a strategy that you don't tell people what to say. You don't tell people like nitpicky, small things. You tell them, here's an overall strategy. Try this once, see how it goes. We'll try something else next, next time. Mm. That's really good. That's a, I think that's a really different way of looking at things. I think it's really helpful to go back and take that step back too. I yeah. It's really important. And then one sort of final one on the, on the mechanics of doing improv, mm -hmm. but 
how do you focus on during the show? How do you focus on your own performance and the success of the team all at once? I mean, it's a dual role that leaders try and take in teams all the time. How do I focus on my performance and the team's performance and everything else that's going on at once? How do you guys manage it? I I think there's two levels to this one. I've, my immediate response to this was, how do I be a producer and a player at the same time? I mm. think that's a slightly different question than you asked. Yeah. Um, on, in the moment, any one of our players does feel responsible for their own performance, and they also feel accountable to the group. So the group is doing this. I need to be aware of exactly what choices the group is making so I can make my own. Um, and that's a juggling act that I think is done best when you worry less about your contribution. If you take yourself out of it a little bit, know that you are there, you're feeling things and you're reacting. But um, if you're judging yourself actively and you hear that voice in your head that says that was a bad idea, never do that again. Next, we should do this. That's actually keeping you from listening. Mm. Uh, And if you can ditch that for those three minutes that you're on stage in a scene, when you leave stage and you're sitting on the side, that's when the real important things you got from that scene will occur to you. Yeah, They'll, they'll register with you. As far as um, the leadership component of this, like Ryan and I are uh, minutes before the show thinking about seating numbers and ticket (laughs) prices and merchandise or all this kind of stuff. Um, And so I think the real blessing for the two of us is once we are actually uh, allowing audience members to come in, we get to play a character right away, which is the welcoming Elizabethan actor, right? (laughs) right? And so that means you get to stop uh, at least talking about those things and you get to wind your producer brain down a little bit. And for that, the rest of that time, you're just, you're just a player. You take notes from your director and that's all that, that matters at the end. Right. Okay. Yeah. And is that uh, one of the words uh, that also comes up a lot is presence Mm -hmm. and, and doing some reading and research before this. Again, one of the things that came up was improv is all about having, I think the word was it like immaculate presence. It was someone that someone had used that sort of phrase. How sacred! <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> they they obviously felt that way. But um, how do you is presence a big thing that you must work on? And and how do improv artists and yourself? How do you how do you cultivate and and harvest that presence? I think there are many. There's at least several schools of thought I can think of on this right away. I think um, the one that resonates with me uh, is different from the self-negating version of presence. Like some people say to be truly present, you have to negate your yourself, leave your ego at the door, things Mm -hmm. like that, which I absolutely understand the rationale behind. And I think it's an effective way to deliver a certain kind of uh, note to people. Yep. Uh, I also feel like one of the ways you get comfortable listening is learning about yourself, learning that you're going to have that voice in your head that says certain things at certain times and just to sit there with it (laughs) and let it, let it be there and be like, all right. Yeah. Um, I, I just heard an interview with someone and I wish I could remember her name. She said she named uh, that person like Fred or something like yeah. that. And be like, oh, thanks, Fred. Or yeah. Kevin, maybe it was. Like, thank you. Yeah, good. Okay, we've heard that now. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, I think that's part of being present is taking in all of that sensory data that's so important mm. through your, um, your eyes and ears and, and whatnot, but also bearing in mind that there's another track running at the same time yes. in, inside your mind and it's being affected by that input and it's also affecting your expression I, I think part of being present is just allowing that to happen and not trying to so rigidly control it. Yeah. And does that take, I mean, as an improv artist, is that a skill that you learn or you teach people or is it something that you just get over time with experience? Um, both and, I guess. Right. Uh, there's no substitute for just doing the reps over and over again. Mm. Um, and, uh, and you know, taking classes and hearing these things over and over again helps with that. But at the same time, you can convert those things into, uh, I, I'd say like, concise statements that make sense and then you relearn them again and again like the phrase yes and is a cliche in the improv world but it's because there are so many ways to relearn what it means to say yes um and not all of them are simple um and (laughs) and you you might be sitting backstage three years after the first improv class you ever took and be like ah oh right okay no i think i understand what that means now (laughs) because i just messed it up probably that's great. I, I like that idea of actually naming that voice in your head. So <laughs> you don't get caught up in it. Right. There's, there's that talk about the watcher in, in some of the classic spiritual, spirituality and the, the development, personal development world about being the watcher. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they talk about stepping back. And when you hear your voice talking, it's like, who is that voice? If that's not me and I'm asking the question, of who is the <laughs> voice, then the voice can't be mine. <laughs> I think it's a much more simple way to look at it is. Fred. <laughs> yeah, Fred. <laughs> I think that's um, good. Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, it is like a character. Like, Fred's part of you. You have to be comfortable yeah. with that. Fred's, yeah, that's all right. 
Um, and Fred's a bit of a dick, but yeah, <laughs> like, <that's right. laughs> just get comfortable with Fred, your dick housemate. That's that's, that's, that's that, part of your house. That's exactly <laughs> right. Everyone's got one, as they say. Sure, sure. <laughs> All right, let's talk about just for a minute improv as a training technique. I'm interested because partly the work that I do, always looking at these different things that businesses and teams in the corporate world can actually bring back and mm -hmm. and start to do to improve themselves as a team. Now, talking all the stuff we've talked about today so far. It all screams, hey, guys, this is really great stuff. <laughs> good, <laughs> good. <laughs> but I'm interested to know in your perspective and what you've thought, what are some of the lessons, some of the big ones, maybe two or three, that improv have translated or could be applicable in business or, or life experience for you? My favorite part about being in an improv troupe is the formation of a great ensemble dynamic. I think that with a skillful director, um, or any kind of skillful leader who prioritizes the way that people feel uh, and prioritizes making the space welcoming mm. and accepting of mistakes, I think that you give people permission to be a little bit vulnerable and to actually learn something about each other, mm. um, then they will do far better work. Uh, I think in the transition from the stage to, let's say, the boardroom mm. or you know wherever you are in the in the business, that um, while a lot of the names for the competencies, so to speak, will change, um, the actual core skills will stay more or less the same. For yes. the man from the management aspect, it is about that kind of sensitivity to the way people feel. And from the on-the-ground perspective, it is about learning how to listen to the people who are contributing and to learn how to acknowledge that to them so that they feel the validation that's really mm. necessary for trust. And then what's one, if you can think of one, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, say you had a team or something you want to do with people that are listening, is there a simple exercise that you could have teams do that could help that's based in improv? Is there is there like one sort of simple exercise a group could get together at their next, I don't know, <laughs> team meeting and say, hey, instead of talking about performance, <laughs> we're going to have we're gonna have five minutes, we're going to do this improv exercise. Is there a quick one that you can think of that might, that might be available to people? One, there's um, a classic kind of, level one day one exercise that's called dinner party or conversations as real people depends on who you talk to um, mm. it's a sort of not so subtle trick to get people into the performance space by just being themselves so you have a bunch of people in a room who are just sitting across from each other in pairs talking just about themselves about their lives and you give them three to five minutes just to have a chat mm -hmm. um, and if they know each other well they'll talk about that if they don't know each other they'll do the introductory type things and then um, after about five minutes, you just ask them all to pause and you say, okay, would people over here in group number eight, whatever, um, just pick up right where you were and we're all just going to be quietly here listening. Ignore us. Mm. Um, people freak out a little bit, but they're like, whoa, everyone's listening to me. Um, but once they see that people aren't going to critique them about it, um, the conversations are great. And you kind of bounce around from group to group and let them pick up where they left off. Um, and then everyone starts kind of laughing and yeah. because in spite of themselves, people are funny uh, and they, they come up with these wonderful specifics that you couldn't invent. Right. Uh, and so other people's lives are so fascinating, but they don't want to admit that to themselves because it would make them exceptional or strange or weird. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a fun way to get people realizing that what they have already is enough. Uh, and yeah. that we could, we could sit there and listen to them for 10, 15 minutes and really enjoy ourselves uh, I think it's a great intro. <laughs> right. That is good. I like it. I like it. And 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 similar to that theme then, is there a – if you could say there's one mindset that people could take away that you've, you've obviously developed or, or bring into improv, mm -hmm. if there's one mindset that people could perhaps practice more in their workplace mm -hmm. or in their relationships, what do you think that mindset – what sort of – the most powerful mindset, if you like, that you've got out of, um, out of improv in your experience? Uh, I would say – so I'm going to try to make the jump from skill to mindset in this one. The skill that jumps out to me is listening. Yes. So there's so much that goes into listening, so many actual practices that mm. produce good listening and reflect good listening. And I think um, the mindset that goes into good listening is a, a dual mindset. And one of those is I'm enough. So what I contribute is good enough uh, and it's worth people listening to. And then the other side of that is sort of its inverse, which is to say that um, – what happens around me is worth my attention mm -hmm. uh, and that it affects me. So I'm enough and these and things that happen to me affect me. And if you can admit both of those things at once, then you'll give offers when you have them uh, 
and with no hope of them being perfect. And then you'll also actually notice other people's offers when they make them. I was reading a book and it's called Yes And and it's an improv book by the people that I think it's called Second City, which is yeah. the, the famous one improv. Of, one of the homes of sketch comedy and improv. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're one of the meccas really, I should say. Yeah, and it's a great book. Um, one of the things that I was reading in it is they said it, and I think it was in the introduction, they said when we're in improvisation mode, we automatically become better leaders and better followers. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested. And to me, that jumped out at me and I was like, wow, that's an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm interested. What's what's your take on that? I very much agree. I mean, they're preaching to the choir with me. (laughs) But uh, we have a sort of um, one of our many mantras, I guess, in the improv worlds is that when you're really in the flow of a scene, there aren't leaders and followers, Mm -hmm. but instead you're following the follower. Uh, And what that means is you're willing to bring your offer to the table and you're just as willing to let it go. Um, You're willing to make what your scene partner does the most important thing. Uh, And sometimes that's by adding something to it. Sometimes it's by honoring it and showing that you heard it. Mm. Um, But when you find a group of people that you learn to really trust and communicate with, you have confidence to lead when you have to. And you also have humility to listen and to be led when you need to be. Yep. Yeah, I think both are critical. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. My take, for what it's worth, is that when I hear people talk about better leaders and better followers, it's almost like they're splitting mm-hmm. the same person. Yeah. Like I think every the, the ultimate teammate is someone who can lead and can follow. It can do both at the right time. And I think that's how you get to be sort of the ultimate teammate or team player, if you mm-hmm. like. Um, and I think those skills that you've got have just shown and what we've talked about today have shown us that if you had those skills, those mindsets, and you practice them, mm-hmm. you're ultimately going to become a better team player. And that's really what it's all about. Yes, you'll get leadership out of it. Mm-hmm. And I think some people look at improv, well, it's good for leadership training. Improv's good for building teams. And mm-hmm. it's really both. It, but this idea that you've got to be one or the other, I think is the big thing that I've taken away from talking to you today is that that really doesn't have to be the case. Absolutely not. Yeah. I'm glad that's a takeaway. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud of that. The, just like before we talked about introverts and extroverts yeah. um, as though they couldn't be the same person, depending on a situation or depending on experience, uh, leaders and followers always have to coexist as the same people. And we always have to take initiative. Um, we, otherwise we would just, we just wouldn't be a thing that exists. That's <laughs> you right. know, we, we act, we move, we influence things that are influenced in turn and we can't avoid that. So I think the social distinction that we make there is really what's what people are talking to, that yeah. there, there's a sort of status and that status confers a kind of definition to you as a person. Um, and like you say, the truth is that in action, that status um, requires a lot more openness <laughs> yes. than it seems. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Now, I think that's that's the perfect place for us to sort of end our Great. formal <laughs> our formal chat on the business side of things. But we do have something else we like to do on on barn raises. I know I sort of put you through the ringer with the Shakespeare songs, <laughs> and you aced that. Now, if you're up for it, we've got ten more quick questions that I'd like to ask you to finish up. Okay, fire away. That we ask everyone. So, yeah. all right, let's go with number one. What is the one thing that you feel must be present or created for a team to succeed? I think um, mutual trust amongst an ensemble, amongst a group, it's the single most important thing. Brilliant. Number two, what is the one thing you feel must be avoided or overcome in order for a team to succeed? I think um, not acting because you fear failure is the greatest obstacle to to any team. So if if you're inactive because you're afraid to fail, then you may as well have not not been there at all right <laughs> yeah and that's that's and we all have that fear so i think that's our great our yep. great challenge yeah. got to overcome that one yeah all right number three what team current or historic would you love to have been a member of i have two answers uh, i'll let you have two answers. yes okay good <laughs> uh, cheating uh so the first is um i don't know if you're familiar with the tv show that just came out called uh, the handmaid's tale I haven't seen um, that one. It's based on a, a book by Margaret Atwood, which is just phenomenal. And it's just a beautifully done show. They're just partway through the first season now. Uh, it's so stylistically rich and faithful to its source material and really just great to watch. Mm. I think being a writer or involved in the production of a really great serial um, cinematic type show yep. would be so much fun. 
uh, that'd be a great experience. And the other thing that came to my mind was um, something I have no technical experience for, <laughs> but working on artificial intelligence um, with yes. a group like, say, Google's DeepMind, or um, uh, I think Elon Musk is starting a new initiative on AI. Mm. I find it absolutely fascinating. And I think the the kind of ethical and technical questions around it are some of the most cutting edge and scary and wonderful that are out there right now yeah Yeah. i would love to just meet the kinds of people who are great at that i think they would be really fantastic to know terrific yeah all right both good answers i know why you're trying to pick one or the other (laughs) all right who is an ultimate team player in your eyes and why um so rather than naming a specific person i'll give you like a type an archetype Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know when kids play on the playground and they play like um like they're shooting each other or playing like right uh, and they're pretending to do it so the kid that actually falls down dead when he gets shot right that's like that's the best team player i can come up with because all the kids are willing to like make the pew pew noises and like talk about how great their their guns are um but so many of them just pretend like they were missed yep and it's so much less fun than dramatically dying in the middle of the playground (laughs) Uh, i love that kid (laughs) that's a great answer i love that answer all right what three qualities make someone a great teammate or colleague um i'm gonna sound like a broken record with this one i think but listening the first one, like the ability to listen uh, and to expect l- good listening in return. And then um, I think the second one is kindness. Mm-hmm. I think that there's not really a substitute for just doing your best to be good to people, um, even when there's high stakes. Um, and then finally, I would say commitment, which is to say that you will do the thing that's asked of you and you will you will show your shared uh, drive to these values that you have as a group. Um and you'll stick with it even when it's difficult. Mm-hmm. Great. And what three qualities then make someone a great coach or manager, or in your case, producer or director, I'd say, from your world, maybe oh, a bit yeah. more? <laughs> well, I'm sure that each of those specific roles have sort of different shades on these, but sure. I think any good leader has to prioritize the, the feeling of the ensemble. That is to say that um, to really have the temperature of the room, to use the cliche, and to mm. know um, how relationships are working, um, how people feel about themselves, and what sorts of things can you do to make sure that's as positive as possible. I think that's that's so important. Uh, and the second thing is that this person values process over products, mm-hmm. um, which is hard to say when you're asking people to pay for a show you're putting on because you do have a product, and yep. it's important, and, it, and it, we do get judged by our product, and we know that. But a good director, for example, um, or even any kind of good leader, I think is going to value the process that produces that and, and be able to connect moments of that process to the end result right. and focus on those moments instead of the end result. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and perfect. Time. Yeah. Finally, um, I would say that a good leader needs to be able to acknowledge the truth of the room. Um, so that is to say when things aren't going well, mm. uh, they need to be forthright with the people about that. And that doesn't mean crude or mean. It means honest, I yep. think. And because that to me is going to inspire trust and it's also going to actually enable growth. Yep. Yeah. Great answers. <laughs> okay. What is number seven? What is one thing that instantly makes you feel part of a team? Um, this is going to seem egocentric probably because it is, I guess, but being given a voice. Yep. Um, I, I've always been the kind of person who's a talking learner. I learn by discussing things with people and picking their brains, asking questions and I know that if I'm given the chance to kind of talk things out with people, that I feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what is one thing, number eight, what is one thing that instantly makes you feel excluded from a team? I think um, watching people ignore each other is one of the things that turns me off the most about an environment. Mm-hmm. When I see that someone speaks or contributes something and it is not acknowledged, then I, I mean, personally, I, I feel less confident about contributing myself because I don't know how I'm going to be received. Right. And I also have other kind of emotional reactions to that that are going to cloud my ability to to receive the other things that, that people say. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Number nine, what is your fondest team memory? So um, about a year ago, actually, um, Sooth Players went to our first regional gig, which was really exciting. We we went to the Shakespeare on the River Festival in Stratford, Victoria, mm-hmm. which is, in fact, on the River Avon, yes. um, all of which we love. Uh, <laughs> and we celebrated Shakespeare's uh, birth slash death anniversary there. Yeah. And this isn't even from the shows we put on, which were really fun. Um, it was actually the night before the show. Um, we 
went to a masquerade ball that they put on. And it was the group of, I think, maybe six or seven of us who were there. We all showed up in our costumes and wearing Commedia dell'arte masks, right. like really goofy. And we just right. we just got to have dinner and a good time together as a, as a group, uh, being really goofy. And yeah. um, everyone who was there from the town was really fun. And there was a great band. And we got to meet people that were seeing our shows. Yep. And it was in that kind of moment, I we just felt really connected as a group and it was really fun to share that kind of experience that was not strictly in the theater or at rehearsal or preparing right. for a festival but it was we were still acting as a team in a kind of way yeah and I, I i just had so much fun it sounds great yeah <laughs> it sounds like a really fun night yeah. and number 10 what is one thing you would like to hear a coach or director manager or your teammates say about you I think one of the best compliments an improviser can receive um, is that they make other improvisers look good. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's always tempting to be keeping your focus centered on what you can do. And often that means you take focus when you do that, you absorb people's attention. Um, a skill I'm continuing to work on and one that I feel very proud of if it happens is if something that I manage to contribute or do makes someone else the center of really positive attention, mm. whether it's an audience response or other players or what have you. Like, I think that's just one of the most gratifying experiences. Sure. Yeah. Terrific. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's the end of the team huddle. All right. Not too bad. <laughs> Ready <hey>? break. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, we're, I think we're just about done, I think, Adam. But um, before we go and before we wrap things up, I mean, we haven't touched on your PhD that you're doing much or – where we can find you online and, and what Sooth Play is, is coming up with next or what you're doing, and even the coaches or classes. Hand the microphone over to you. <laughs> what, um, give us the spiel. What, what, are you, what are you up to now? What's, what's next for Sooth Players, and, and what, what are you guys doing? Okay, so we've just finished Comedy Festival, uh, and we are enjoying the calm after the storm somewhat, <laughs> uh, but there's no rest for the wicked, really, because we, we've got preparations in order for a couple of seasons we have coming up. Um, Improvised Potter is going to have a, a season at the Butterfly Club in August of this year, which we're very excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, both Improvised Potter and Shakespeare will be playing at this year's Melbourne Fringe Festival. Uh, the details of both of those runs are being finalized currently, but yeah. all those details will be available on our websites, uh, www.soothplayers.com, as well as improvisedpotter.com.au. Uh, we also keep people up to date with our social media pages or media social, as we say in Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> and those are at Sooth Players for the Shakespeare show and at Improv Potter for the Potter show. Uh, you can also get some cheeky discounts if you subscribe to our mailing lists or if you uh, if you follow us on social media. Sometimes we release codes and things like that. Awesome. Terrific. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it. I've, I've learned a ton today, Adam. So I really, <laughs> I really do appreciate it. I look forward to... Learning more about the world of improv. Uh, thanks and, very much. And also seeing you guys again. I can't wait. So, uh, Well, we've got a ticket for you next time you want to come. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. All right. So, Adam, thanks again. I really do appreciate it. Thanks so much. So what did you think of that? I thought the conversation had it all. We got an improv performance. In case you're wondering, yes, Adam really did make those lyrics up on the spot. We got an awesome insight into how improv artists think on their toes, how they manage to pull together as a team, and how someone like Adam has used improv to develop himself as both a leader and a team player. And most of all, we got insane wisdom. I mean, that answer about the ideal team player being the kid who actually falls down when they're pretending to be shot, playing soldiers or cops and robbers, that just blew me away. So Adam, thank you. And I can't wait to come and see another show from Sooth Players really soon. And if you're interested in catching a show or getting in touch with Adam, please do so. The links are in the show notes, but you can catch Adam and all things Sooth Players on the website www.soothplayers.com. That's S O O T H players.com. Or on social media at Sooth Players. That's the handle that they use pretty much everywhere. As I said, it's a really fun night out, and if you want to see a real team in action, then get along and catch one of their shows as soon as you can. So that's about it for this week. But I do want to remind you guys about how you can support us and the show. 
The best way by far is to tell your friends or share us online. The show is growing, but we really want to crack that new and noteworthy section on iTunes, and our time is running out. So please, this week especially, can you please share our links to the show on Facebook or on Instagram and tell all your friends to tune in and give it a listen. And just because I'm in a really pushy mood this week, I'm also going to ask if you can leave us a review on iTunes and help spread the Team First message. Of course, you can always follow us on social media and join in the conversation. We're on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Just look us up using the handle at BarnRaisersPod. Well, that's it. I've been Dan Stones, this has been Barn Raisers, and until next time, remember, the average team will always fear failure but the outstanding team fears being average even more. Bye for now.